Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jeff. I, I uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, and uh, welcome, everyone. It's very gratifying to see a lot of uh, my former students uh, in the audience. Uh, I hope your business, your law business practices are thriving despite the information I provided you during, or the misinformation perhaps that I provided you during class. Um, so the, the title of this panel is The Business of Law Practice. And the panelists and I, we spoke together with the, orga other, the organizers, the overall organizers beforehand. And here's what we came up with uh, in the exercise of giving content to that. We'll be focusing on uh, law as a business in significant measure. And I'll give you more specific topics we'll address. But uh, another way in which business figures in the discussion today is that uh, all of the panelists uh, also have familiarity and involvement with uh, business law. And so hopefully that's cues closely enough to the title to satisfy everybody's interests. Uh, I also very much want to thank the panelists here today, a very um, busy group of folks who've taken time out of their schedule to talk with us. And so I, I very much appreciate your taking the time to do that. Here's the format. Uh, first, I'm going to have the panelists briefly introduce themselves. And then we're going uh, w to work through, one at a time, a series of topics. The topics will be, first of all, uh, the future of the job market. Where will the jobs be? Um, some of them are not there right now. Um, planning for the future job market. How do you qualify for the jobs of the future? How can you position yourself to get those jobs, whether you're currently a law student or you're already out in practice? Uh, the future of hiring practices. Um, are there adjustments in the way that uh, employers, whether law firms or corporations or other arrangements, uh, are deciding whom they'll hire? And if so, uh, what can you do about it? And then the future of uh, the business of law as well. Can, is there knowledge about business development or other related topics that can help you in your career? So that's the, those are the four broad topics. The emphasis you might notice is on um, predicting the future rather than lamenting the, our current plight, um, which uh, I think everyone can do without anyone else's help. So uh, let's start off with the introductions. And, and uh, one last point about format. I'd like to have this be as interactive as possible. So what I will do is introduce a subject, get some feedback from the, the panel, comments from as many of the panelists who want, uh, want to talk about a particular issue. And then we'll have a kind of question or comments and response period before we move on to the next topic. And I'll try to be mindful of the time so we get through as many of these topics as we can while giving you all a chance to make your comments and ask your questions. So uh, why don't we begin uh, with Al Pack and do uh, introductions from my left to my right. Good morning. Uh, first, let me thank Bernie Atterbury and Judge, uh, Dean Brand uh, for inviting me to be here with you today. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I am in-house counsel to Semper Energy, which is a Fortune 200 company headquartered in San Diego, California. Um, I'll have a lot to say about the four topics that we're going to address today, but let me make, you know, in, in, let me make two comments uh, to start. First. I'm here not only to help you, but to recruit. Um, we are a growing company, and we are looking for a competent counsel to help us in that growth pattern. I've successfully hired one person from USF, and I was successful in recruiting another. So I have a very strong bias as an alum to hire USF graduates, because I know the quality of the people that come through here. Uh, the second thing is because uh, Dean Brand mentioned that there are media in the room, let me tell you that right off the top, and although this never works, uh, the views of the speaker are his own and do not necessarily represent the views of the senior management of Sempra Energy. You know, I, I was going to start off talking about our objectives on the panel today, and I was the one thing we can't do, I was going to say, is give you a job. It, it turns out that may not be right. So this, is, this could be Not really, today, anyway. <laughs> could be a really fantastic panel. <laughs> okay, uh, Jennifer Kinsey. Good morning. And and thanks for having me. Um, I'm honored to be here and happy to be here. I am a litigation partner at Nixon Peabody here in San Francisco. I uh, do primarily work in the mass tort area, but my, um, my experience in the business of law comes from the fact that I'm also on our firm's management committee. We have an 850 lawyer firm uh, that has offices throughout the United States and offices in Paris and in China. And there's an eight-person group that basically runs the business. And I have the good fortune to be um, a member of that group and spend about almost half my time in that endeavor. So um, 
that's um, why I have, I guess, some insight into some, into some of the issues from a big firm perspective here today. Great. Uh, and then Peter and Peter are to my right. Uh, yes, Peter first. I'm uh, Peter Zoichhauser. I'm the chairman of a nine-person consulting group called the Zoichhauser Group. We consult in three areas, strategic growth planning, mergers and acquisitions, and strategic marketing to large law firms, meaning Amlaw 200, Global 100. I have been doing that for about 15 years. Before that, I was general counsel at the Irvine Company in Newport Beach, a large real estate development company, uh, for 15 years. And uh, without going into too much detail with the anxiety about the job market, uh, I clerked for a large law firm my second year of law school. I worked for the Legal Aid Society uh, after my first year of law school. Um, I, went, I was a pro bono plaintiff's environmental litigator for two years. Then I joined a 20-lawyer law firm. So I've had a, quite a varied background in, on, the, on the subject of today, which we're going to talk about. What is there for lawyers to do? There's a lot. It's, it's not as bleak out there as you think. And, uh, the, the degree that uh, folks in school are about to get uh, can bring you a, quite a, a varied future and something with a lot of terrific challenges. So it's not so dismal. Good morning. I'm Peter Astis, uh, class of 82, so I'm glad to be back here and uh, sharing ideas with you. Um, I'm a partner with DLA, Part uh, DLA Piper, which uh, in the local market is a successor to uh, Great Carey Ward and Friedenrich, where, where I was at, as well as Steinhard and Falconer in San Francisco. I'm in Palo Alto. I do corporate and securities, uh, mostly focused on the technology world, um, IPOs when they're out there, and uh, M&A and venture capital and the like. I'm also the co-chair of our global technology practice, so um, I'm responsible for coordinating our practice across geographies and across practice groups. Um, DLA is uh, for somewhat over 3,000 lawyers in, uh, in uh, 50 jurisdictions, so there's a, there's a lot to coordinate across lots of different places. Uh, uh, but um, uh, again, I'm happy to be here. Great, great. Well, thank you all, and again, uh, appreciate your coming. So the first topic is the future of the job markets. Where will the jobs be? And uh, I want uh, the panelists to feel free to be relatively creative about this. It could be at law firms, it could be at corporations or other entities, or it could be in other roles, perhaps less traditional roles, that may be expanding in part in response uh, to the current economic circumstances. So why don't we uh, reverse the order just to keep things exciting, and Peter Astis, do you want to sure. start with your thoughts on that, and we'll just work our way across and then open it up to the audience. Yeah, I mean, my first thought on that is that um, uh, having practiced for over 25 years, I, I've been through a lot of ups and downs where, particularly in the business transactional market, where things would just stop when uh, there would be a disruption in the market and you couldn't get transactions done. And every time that happens, people are speculating about how much is the business going to change the law business when uh, you come out of that situation. And when we're again in that kind of a period now where there's a lot of speculation about how much will there be in change in the legal profession. And I happen to be one who believes that this time, because of the extent of the um, uh, recession and as well as some other dynamics that are already going on in the market, that we are going to see a lot more change. And, and change means opportunities. Um, specifically, I think the change, particularly on the transactional side, but also on litigation, involves the, the corporate corporations, which are the main uh, uh, clients for obviously the larger law firms, uh, the increasing pressure on costs and on alternative billing arrangements. Um, basically, if you're going to drive down costs, um, you, you can cer certainly drive it down a little bit by uh, achieving efficiencies, but somehow you have to change the model. Uh, law firms can't be paying people the same amount of money and billing them out at the same kind of rates and bring down the costs. Um, so where that comes in opportunities, I think, is that, uh, and a number of firms have made announcements, uh, including mine, about considering different arrangements of this kind, is, is firms will take slightly different models to servicing the client needs. Um, that will include firms having different track uh, uh, attorneys on staff, not all being on partner track uh, attorneys. It'll mean firms hiring more contract lawyers. It'll mean firms subcontracting certain work. Uh, it means opportunities for smaller firms and solos to do some of the work that big firms were doing that they simply cannot do at the cost uh, margins that uh, uh, clients are requiring. So I think there's change out there. The ultimately, uh, the key issue is, of course, that clients 
expect cutting edge expertise uh, in whatever they're hiring for and they expect 24 by 7 availability uh, and for big firms they expect scalability to be able to kind of handle whatever needs to be handled and those are the things that people get paid for um, so my big message to people is to say focusing on areas uh, where there is going to be feed pressure where you can develop expertise uh, and either on your own or partnering uh, with uh, uh, other firms, I think there are going to be increasing opportunities in, in the upcoming years. Good. Uh, Peter Zughauser. I would agree with everything Peter said. If, uh, for people who are in a particularly vexing situation, uh, like two L's uh, and uh, one L's and maybe some three L's who don't have jobs, I would find some way to get experience practicing law uh, whether that's through an outsourcing company, uh, whatever, however different it may look like from what you had anticipated, uh, whether that was joining a big firm or a small firm, uh, being an independent contractor, uh, banding together with a few of your fellow graduates and forming a small outsourcing company and pitching your services at lower rates uh, to some of the larger firms in town or around the country, uh, I think are, there, there will be opportunities there. Uh, what the, the, there's a big question going around, is leverage dead in law firms? Uh, if le meaning, meaning, is there a place for law firms that have a lot of, uh, of uh, people doing a lot of uh, work on big litigations and big transactions at lower rates than the partners? Um, if leverage is dead, we have a different kind of problem. I don't think leverage is dead, it's just that it's going to be created differently, not with $160,000 a year associates across the board. It's going to be created with outsourcing, and uh, and and if you can develop uh, a little experience practicing uh, at some of the uh, entry level work, uh, there are going to be big opportunities there because law firms are going to have big demand, and they're going to they're just going to cut back on their hiring of one hundred and sixty thousand dollars year associates at least for the next three or four years. I, I I will say that I think the future is extremely bright. There are a lot of reasons for that. Maybe we'll have time to go into them later. But the future is extremely bright for the legal industry. And the time will return when the demand for lawyers will exceed the supply and salaries will go up. So I think you're in a trow. It's a little bit longer than past trows. It could go on a few more years. But go out and find a way to get some experience because in the end, uh, there will be great demand for legal services. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Kinsley. Okay, I think that there's a lot of discussion today about a paradigm shift in the way the law firm model works with the very rigid classes of associates and uh, the summer programs and the hiring two years out. I think that's all at this point kind of up in the air, as everyone says. I think that there there is a there's potentially a change in the model that we're seeing the beginnings of right now. And I think you've all heard about it and felt it in recent months with this last year's summer programs and, and you know, the, the hiring market today. What I think is, is going to, I think the bright spot in this is that it's going to allow people a lot more different types of opportunities. Certainly when I started in the practice of law, uh, there was, you had a path and it was very rigid and it was very hard to move between different types of um, legal um, jobs. Although Peter seems to have done a good job. <laughs> um, it was, it was it, in some, I remember when I started, I was told that it would be very hard if I went to a big firm, I could, you know, that was, if I wanted to be at a big firm, it would be very hard to move from a public interest job or from some other job into a big firm. I think that's all changed. And I think that there's, uh, you know, a legal career spans a long time, or can span a long time. There's plenty of time to do a lot of different types of, um, different types of jobs during one's legal career. So I think that there's gonna be a lot more flexibility, certainly at all levels of the market, in people moving between different types of um, legal jobs. You can go, I think it'll be easier to go from a small firm to a big firm. Um, I think there's a lot of firms that now hire um, I think there's a lot of hiring done at the second to five year level rather than at the first year level. So that allows people to do things differently now, to perhaps follow something that they 
um, are very interested in and use that as a as a way to you know move into the law. You know, Peter, I, I would sort of disagree with something maybe or take a different tack than Peter took about going out and getting you know a finding a legal job. I think in some ways it might, particularly for first years who are, who are facing now an incredibly difficult job market, you might want to think about doing something that would distinguish um, you from others that are out there looking for a job. And if you want to be a construction lawyer, um, maybe work construction for a year or two and have a slightly different um, you know, approach and more knowledge about what you're interested in or work in an emerging company, or go out and find a job in the IP field, because, again, because the legal career is so long, I think people have the opportunity to catch up. You know, that first two, year, two years is not going to make a huge amount of difference in your ultimate um, career. So I think that this is a remarkable time for opportunity to do things a little differently and to maybe break away from some of what has been um, you know, bedeviling the legal profession in terms of the rigidness of the way that we've, we've looked at, you know, the career path. Right. Uh, Alpat. Um, let me kind of give you a little view, a little different view uh, from corporate counsel's side. Um, I know that we're not generally thought of as the marquee employers in the legal industry. Um, I tried to interview some interns last summer and I saw the long list of people who wanted to interview at the marquee firms here in town. And I got three people to come talk with me and have a cup of coffee. So I, I know that people don't think of in-house counsel as the kind of work that they had really aspired to when they entered law, uh, law school. But I'll tell you that there are a lot of opportunities for both entry and to develop a pretty rewarding career. From co a corporate perspective, we look at legal expense as a non-discretionary but manageable cost. And so we will hire in-house counsel to fill essentially what we think are our daily routine requirements uh, whether it's in litigation, uh, securities analysis, environmental law, so that we can sustain the corporation on a day-to-day -day basis. We will go outside, as you've heard from some of the others, uh, to pick up unusual, non-recurring work that requires special expertise or to, to handle our peak requirements. There are some instances where due diligence would require us to use outside counsel, and we'll do that. Uh, one thing that has been changing, and I see this particularly in our company over the last 24 months, is that it's very rare that we will hire a firm and pay standard billing rates. We tend to use negotiated contract rates um, and tiered rates by and large. Again, this is a cost-benefit analysis that we're doing. Uh, if your billing rate and our estimated number of hours as to the intensity and duration of the work uh, means that we should rather, we should hire somebody and bring them in. We'll do that because not only do uh, we save costs, but we're adding to the expertise of the corporation. Uh, let me add something to um, what Jennifer said. It is uh, we have about 250 lawyers employed at Sempra Energy. This is an 11,000 person firm. Uh, only 75 of them are employed full-time in the law department. Uh, either people have law degrees and bar certificates and are coming in to entry-level administrative positions, or they've left the law department because of the expertise they've developed in working with different functional groups within the corporation and have become senior managers. That is not unusual in any company that I'm familiar with. Um, so if you're looking for entry-level positions, uh, we're always looking to hire smart people. We have continuous needs given our size. Uh, and it's, uh, there's more than one way to get in. In fact, one of the ways that we find out who's got a, um, a law degree in our company is we have a fairly substantial in-house MCLE program. So when people show up, you kind of figure out that they're doing that for a reason. And it, it's pretty surprising when you find out who has a, a law degree, either very junior or very senior. So I'll, I'll tell you, as a living organism, it's a nice place to work. Now, there are cultural differences that you should be aware of, and I think your counselors can tell you more about that. It's, uh, it's an, it, there are some trade-offs that you make between law firms and 
corporations. I, I came out of a mid-sized law firm based in Los Angeles, and I'll tell you there were advantages and disadvantages uh, to that kind of a practice. And um, for the moment, I find Sempra to be uh, a good place to be. Wonderful. Okay, so that's, that fills me with all sorts of uh, questions and comments, but I'm going to resist the urge to, uh, to share them until the audience has a chance. Um, I think that was a pretty rich presentation, and there were all sorts of little teasers in there that I can imagine you might want to follow up on. So, um, uh, Anita, can you uh, take you know, perhaps a mic, and then if anyone who has a, a question or a comment to which they would like a response, why don't we take a, a few minutes to do that, uh, and then we can ask the panel to respond. Does anyone have questions or comments? We have one back there in the middle. Well, well, Anita's going there, I would just say I agree with what's been said, and I would say in the interim, if you could find out, a, uh, if you can find a job where you can learn leadership skills and team leading skills, this is what the law is turning to it in, in most of the big firms, many, many of the regional firms. Uh, someone who has the ability to lead a team and manage a project is a critical player and has invaluable skills for clients and law firms. Anything like that, whatever job you can find where you can develop those skills will pay off. Great, thank you. Um, a question or a comment? Oh, hi, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about something that um, Ms. Kustner had raised about a possible paradigm shift, and it seems that things have been based largely on billable hours, and I was wondering whether the, the panel has noticed any type of shift with law firms and clients away from the billable hour structure, and if so, what alternative types of structures are being uh, considered? Why don't you answer, and then if other folks want to comment on that, we can open that as well. Yeah. I, I suspect most firms are today discussing internally and offering to client any number of alternative fee models. Um, I certainly know that we discuss it. There are there are ways to um, to price legal services that aren't based on the billable hour and can you know be can offer um, both sides of the you know of that bargain what they need. So I think that the billable hour is definitely um, something that is not necessarily going to be the way all legal services are priced in the future, and it certainly isn't now. Uh, you have fixed fees. You have you know, you have success fees. There's all sorts of models that you can use. What I think was interesting is that there's there's two firms I know that I've read about recently, not ours, that have gone to a model with their first years where their billable hour requirement has changed drastically. And I think that's really an interesting way of kind of looking at the profession, too, in that um, these two firms that uh, both have San Francisco offices, I think Cowrie is one and Oric is one, have got, have really drastically reduced their billable hour requirement for their first years now and ask the first years to learn more about the practice and to do more pro bono and to do more um, shadowing of other attorneys so that they can actually learn rather than billing out their time. I think they've gone you know, down into the under 1,000 hour range for billable hours, which I think is a remarkable shift and a really positive, in my view, I think that's a positive way of looking at things because from the Law firms from the, I mean, Al, you can probably talk more about this, but certainly I, we have received letters from clients, or we've received requests from clients not to have first years work on matters because the price of the first year, you know, it's, it's all falls from the salary issues, and the price of the first year is, is you know, to make the law firm work becomes very high, and the, the, for a first year lawyer, it's very hard to, um, in some ways, justify the price unless it's a, you know, very skilled and, you know, all of that. So it's getting away from that model of the billable hour to actually allow people to become more skilled before they, you know, get into those that kind of hourly charge. And that I think will allow firms to also price matters differently. You could put a first year on, not expect to charge those hours, and um, that's a win-win situation. Uh, Peter Zuckerberg, you want to comment as well? And there's another. And yeah, I think there's someone up here. I would just say that historically, about f if typical number for an, an Amlaw 200 firm was about 5% of the annual gross revenues would be on non-hourly rate work, alternative fee arrangements. We're, uh, we work with uh, one Wall Street 
firm uh, that this year went from that to 20% and another that sees going to 40% between this year and next year. Those are big numbers for those firms, those excess of $100 million uh, a year in alternative fee arrangements. And I think you will see over the next five years a move in that direction somewhere between 25 and 50 percent to be kind of the norm in alternative fee arrangements as opposed to 5 percent. Principally flat fee, but some hybrid fee arrangements that include success fees uh, depend, depending on the nature of the matter. Great. I think there was a hand uh, right up here, Anita. Thank you so much. Anyone want to? No, just, I would just reconfirm uh, you know, the increasing percentage of transactions and, and also what Peter talked about about management. When you take on a client and you're doing handling all their litigation in a certain area for $20 million a year or something like that, the management of that process to make sure that the attorneys are being very efficient, the right people are being assigned, uh, you basically have shifted the risk, of course, from the traditional way where the law firms, the risk was all on the client to the, the law firm. So the people were able to manage that, which is a completely different skill that's not taught in law school, uh, uh, are the ones who will be very successful in, uh, in the firms uh, going forward. Great. Yeah, there was a recommendation, I'm a second year at USF, and there was a recommendation that we should band together for outsourcing opportunities once we graduate, but how do you reconcile that with the idea that first year associates are usually considered not very experienced and a lot of clients request that first years don't work on problems or their matters. So how are we supposed to encourage firms to hire us as independent contractors if their clients don't generally want newer attorneys to work on their issues at all? I, I, don't think, I don't think there's any question but that law firms need young attorneys. Uh, and they have to start someplace, and that's the first year. The question is how much uh, will the client pay for that? And the answer is very little, if anything. So, so uh, your rates, you, you know, your, if your rates are going to have to be attractive to the law firms, uh, so that uh, they can uh, deliver the work product that the clients want uh, at a cost that enables them to make enough money, enough profit margin across the board so that they can attract and retain senior level talent that's capable of doing the kind of work the firm would like to attract. And the problem right now is that, is that the, uh, the, the economy is putting so much pressure on fees that it's not uh, profitable enough to pay uh, people $160,000 an hour for that kind of work. So that's why I say you have to shift your expectations a little, band together, you're going to make less money probably, but the key part is get some experience, uh, tough it out for a few years, and uh, trust me, uh, the, 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 the uh, the glory days will come back. And, and I don't disagree with anything that Jenny said, by the way. I think there are other uh, opportunities that you could pursue that would be extremely useful uh, in a career practicing law. You don't just have to get that kind of experience. Can, can I address that from the client side? Yeah, we're not ogres. Uh, <laughs> and when you hear things like that, you know, it's generally the trend since we, the client side now has leverage. Um, yeah, we're going to negotiate the best talent at the lowest available fees. But we understand that law firms work to efficiently manage the billing as well. The reason that, that you hear stories like, we don't want first years, we don't want uh, paralegals doing work that lawyers should be doing, um, is to make sure that we emphasize that because we're going outside for a specific expertise that your firm has, and, and in some cases it's the scalability issue that you talk about, and that definitely means having a deep bench of associates. But the reason we go outside is to hire the expertise of the firm. And, if, and we need to have some guarantee and assurance that we're getting that. We don't want to see an associate standing in front of our senior management or our board of directors 
talking about something that in-house counsel would be fully competent to address. We went outside to get somebody because they could do something for us that in-house counsel can't do, and we want to see that. But, you know, there's, I don't know that, I think what we have is a bias towards competent counsel at what we consider to be a fair and reasonable price. Okay. So as a grade A receivable, that's, you know, that's the way firms have to deal with us. Great. And let me actually use that question as a segue to the next topic. My guess is we will get to at most three, but probably two of our topics, which is, I think is really fine, because I think the first two are by far the most important. But um, let's broaden that, that discussion to, uh, in light of the conversation we've had thus far about the changing nature of the legal practice and where the job will be, what specifically can, so, can someone who's looking for a job in the legal profession do to exploit these anticipated possibilities? And, and, and let me, uh, I'm hoping that the comments, let's go across the panel and then we can again solicit questions and comments from the audience. But I'm hoping we'll have a, a few frames in mind. Uh, one is the law student, somebody, what can, classes can they take, what can they do during law school? Another is a sort of early associate, a first or second year associate. Um, and then other snapshots further along the line, anywhere from a fifth to a 25th or a 30th uh, year uh, practitioner who, for one reason or another in this economy, which I think is happening quite a bit now, finds themselves needing to, to retool. Uh, and some of the issues that I think have cropped up is, are there expertise, is there sort of expertise that somebody can acquire? Uh, is there creative structuring of a business becoming uh, an outsourcer uh, or uh, of legal work, how exactly do you do that? How do you make the connections with the folks who would be sending the work your way? So what, any comments along those lines uh, at a very practical level would be great. And why don't we start uh, with uh, well, anyone eager to start? Uh, now? Go. Uh, just, a, just a couple of points in that, that regard. Um, the first thing is learn how to write. There are so many people in this profession who cannot write regardless of how long they've been in the profession, that you'd be, you can easily distinguish yourself by writing clearly and crisply. And if you do it in a letter or your resume, just evidence that you can write. That's number one. The second thing is, um, you know, and it may be partly the environment, I would encourage you to make earlier career decisions than the kinds of ones that, were, that we were making when I was here in the 1970s. Uh, if you think you want to do a specific area, you want to participate in a field of work, or if, for example, uh, you'll let me recruit you to become in-house counsel. Uh, you know, think about what industries you're interested in and tailor your education to that. Engineering, accounting, all come in very handy in the energy and infrastructure business. Uh, environmental law, uh, corporate compliance, regulatory compliance, Sarbanes-Oxley, those are all the hot topics for in-house counsel take classes on that if they're available. Uh, everybody, most of the, the companies I'm familiar with, in one way or another, end up in some kind of administrative forum where there are hearings. So it's not exactly civil litigation. There are special rules. Take those kinds of courses. There's a lot of smart people in this industry, both in it and entering it. And your job right now is to distinguish yourself from that great big pool of people. And it only takes one or two markers for you to do that. So I would encourage you to figure it out early and then start adding those indicia that you are somewhat different than the pool that you're competing against. Good. Well, I'll just step in. So uh, it's all about going back to the issue about you know hiring different levels of people and what the price is. It's about delivering the service that the client wants and needs and delivering it at the right price. And so the key is what you have control over is de uh, developing the expertise for that area that you want. And, uh, you know, I'm a business lawyer and what I always tell young lawyers is business law is about business. So if you're in law school and you haven't, don't have a business degree, you should be learning about business. You should be you know, reading the Wall Street Journal every day. You should be taking accounting courses. You should understand how the markets work. Uh, you want to be a technology lawyer. You need to understand technology. Uh, there's many, many opportunities to work for companies in a quasi a half lawyer, half business uh, role where you're negotiating deals where the legal training that you have is a great experience. If you've gone out and you understand technology uh, from whatever kind of experience you've been able to develop, um, you have a leg up on over the person who's just walking there and says, I'm a, I'm a good lawyer. So I would restate what was said earlier that 
finding the area that you're really interested in and really looking at it much more holistically than just being a lawyer, but the whole panorama of issues that are associated with that area, whether it's construction, whether it's technology, whether it's securities, and really immersing yourself uh, in that area so that when you go and propose yourself to work for a law firm or work for a, a corporation or work as a solo, you're presenting to them not just I'm a lawyer who's talented, but I know your business, I know your issues, I have experience in that, I can help you, and if you can add on top of that, I'm offering myself at a more reasonable price, that's how you're able to get the ticket. job is not where it ends. And I think that there's, when, particularly for younger lawyers and for, I think, throughout your career, the marketing of yourself doesn't stop. So my suggestion would be that once you get that job, no matter what size organization you're in, you remember that you, you still need to market yourself. You still need to be the person that people want to come to. And to, and to distinguish yourself from others, because there's a lot of smart young lawyers out there who can do the work, and, and you need to figure out a way to distinguish yourself to make the career moves that you can. So my suggestion would be, once you get in a firm, no matter what size, or in, an, in a corporate environment, to uh, be very visible, to, be, to volunteer, to take on as many um, as you can um, comfortably um, types of different um, uh, assignments that you can meet different people within the organization and become known. And that way sort of network and market internally as well as externally because that way you'll get, you'll, you'll distinguish yourself from the rest of the crowd of, of young lawyers that are sitting in their offices looking things up and writing briefs. Um, that's not to um, in any way um, say that all of the basic skill, the, you know, being absolutely the best at the basic skills isn't really important, but there are things that you can do on top of that that um, will really distinguish you within the practice and within the work environment where, you know, take on a, a pro bono matter that you're successful at that then gets um, um, announced to the entire firm. Partners, everyone else remembers that, and you become visible within your workplace, and I think that's really important. I would add a couple of thoughts. Uh, I was in-house for many years, and I can, uh, I agree that practicing in-house is a fabulously challenging career, and if I were going to start over again, I would, I would uh, definitely do that. Uh, I left that job, and I left it because a friend of mine gave me a speech one day that uh, I, di I didn't work for anybody. I was my own boss. And I needed to understand that. I didn't, I didn't work for the Irvine Company. I worked for Peter Zoichhauser. And what I would say is take ownership of your career now. That's really important. No matter where you land, it will be important for you to keep in mind that you are your own boss and you own your own career and only you can make your career it doesn't matter what law school you go to, what undergraduate school you go to, what you wind up doing, it's in your hands. So that's the first thing. Be an owner and take ownership of yourself and plan it out. I would do some market research. This school uh, has a rich network of alumni. Uh, the San Francisco uh, legal market is one of the richest in the world. Uh, Get, just go out and ask lawyers and firms and, and in companies and elsewhere, uh, find a connection and, and find out what's going on in their world to find something that you might have a passion for. You're really just hearing four opinions here. There are hundreds of other opinions about practicing law and having rewarding career, careers. While you're doing that market research, you'll actually be networking and marketing yourselves and make it clear to people that you can be a just-in-time employee. If they have a need in the law, you're interested. And leave behind your name and phone number, your resume, and then stay in touch with them. You don't have to be a nuisance, but stay in touch. Opportunities arise. So I would get out there in the world. I would think I would have a framework for this, and the framework would be uh, what do lawyers actually do? Well, in the world, 
It's the nature of human beings to want to improve their lot. That's the nature of human beings. And they do that by deploying and using assets. Lawyers play a critical role in the consensual and contested use of assets. There are three forms of assets. One is financial. The world's financial assets are about $190 trillion, and lawyers operate right at the center of those assets, how those assets are used. There are intellectual property assets, ideas. We live in an era of mushrooming intellectual property. When the history books are written, this will be known as the time when intellectual property emerged as one of the world's most valuable assets. There are huge opportunities in the law for people who, who help others use intellectual property, either they're in a contested way or in a consensual way. And then there are natural resources, the environment, oil and gas, wind, the sun, all of these, and they're limited, they're, they're, they're declining, and their value is increasing, and there are growing disputes and incredibly growing values in their use. And so those are three areas that you might think about. Find one that you have a passion for, and then find a role you want to play. And then the human condition is in three economies. There are developed economies, like the United States, where it's a powerful economic engine. There are developing and emerging economies, and they aspire to be like the United States, to, to use these assets but they have very different needs. And so you might go work in a developing country, in a developing economy, or an emerging economy, or with emerging uh, companies, and find something that you have a passion for, that you want to pursue in one of these areas, recognizing what lawyers do. They're at the intersection of these. And when I said earlier that, that the future will be bright, the reason is because the world's financial assets, it's the nature of the human race, will continue to grow. That's the human condition. And natural resources will, will continue to be used up and be more and more valuable. And intellectual property will increasingly drive the economy. So any one of these that you choose that you have a passion for uh, will turn out to be, I think, a very fruitful avenue. But the most important thing is make some decisions, take some ownership, and pursue something that you have a passion for. There's, uh Two comments that I, I think often for uh, law students and, and very young associates uh, overlook, and it's the uh, two comments that Peter just made. One is to always be networking. Um, I can't ha say how often I see law students not realizing that if there's someone who could offer them a job, they don't, they don't realize that every interaction is worth pursuing, and that every, um, every informational interview is obviously also a job interview. Uh, but uh, many folks in this audience no doubt already know that. Okay, so the comments and questions in regard to anything that's been said thus far. Uh, and I, you know, I am a law professor, so I do reserve the right to use the Socratic method and call on you at random. And you do have name tags on it, and I am not, in fact, uh, stuck to this chair, nor is this mic stuck in here. So who, I, there's got to be questions and comments. You're great. Uh, so I had a question, uh, sort of, I think a number of the panelists talked about the importance of project management and uh, you know, this paradigm shift for outsourcing. I was just wondering if the panelists could talk a little bit about the intersection between information technology management and then I come, or I, I have spent the last couple of years at a software company and project management, project management institute, these kinds of certifications have become a really big deal as far as uh, bringing the developers uh, to learn to stop looking at their code, which I guess would be equivalent to us writing our pleadings and look at the larger picture so that they can actually ship the software and we all get paid. Um, so I was just curious if some of the panelists could talk about uh, in the law where they see these kinds of project management initiatives going and, and the intersection between like document handling and information technology. Thank you. Well, just to start on the, uh, I, I think the, you know, the ability for technology to add efficiencies, again, the goal, the goal is to be delivering the same or better product to the client at a better price. And so technology absolutely can bring efficiencies to the law just as it has, you know, most other areas. Probably on the litigation side, to date has been more of that case and there's enormous technology issues and all the discovery and, and other kinds of things, which is not really my area. In the, in the corporate area, uh, the issue of using technology for standardized forms, 
Uh, law firms are, uh, are, are providing client uh, tools that clients can use so that they don't have to pay the lawyers for it. There's lots and lots of opportunities for technology to be used uh, just for within the law firm's uh, purposes. And then again, as I said earlier, obviously technology as an issue for the customer base is, is a much bigger issue and there are a tremendous number of opportunities there. Um, I would just agree that the law firms are in the dark ages in terms of technology. <laughs> Knowledge management is something that's in, just in its embryonic and formative stages, and that was a terrific background to bring to uh, the practice of law, I would say. I, I would just, I was going to echo that. Uh, I think of IT mostly as a pain in the ass, because you, you have to rely on it, but it doesn't always work the way that you need to. So, you know, there's always a person in every case or on every project that I know of whose sole function is to make sure that project management is made available on all the interconnected systems that we utilize. Um, unfortunately, I don't think most of the developers have gotten the message that you were describing that the functionality uh, needs to be suited to client needs. So it's, it's obviously a growing area in the law. Um, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on software applications and hardware, and you'll find more often than not that ITs within major corporations are the lowest rated parts of our companies. It is, it's just a fact of life. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my name is Rebecca Hirsch. I finished law school last December, and I'm trying to focus on networking. Um, and uh, the question I have is, how much, how little, how often, how do you stay in touch? I, I, I go to everything that I'm invited to, um, and that's why I'm here. Uh, my mentor is a former um, uh, student from here. And uh, so I don't want to be a pest, and I don't want to be sending emails that might land in a spam folder. So I want to find out what the right balance would be if I were in touch with you. If you got an email from me once a week, would that be too much? So I'm trying to figure out how to stay in touch with someone that you met without being uh, an egg. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Obviously, you have to go to events to which you're not invited. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I would that. just say find more events to go to, more people to get in touch with, and at the end of your conversation, tell them you'd like to stay in touch with them, what would work well for them. Ask them. And then just stay in touch with them on their schedule. And, and you really need to gauge the audience on that a little bit. I mean, that's, a, that's an issue that we deal with in terms of dealing with our clients. You know, how often does my client want to hear from me when I'm, you know, sort of, when I'm just, you know, reaching out to the client? And my own personal rule is, if I, if, if I want a client, if I want to be sort of top of mind for a client, it's about, every, if I, w I don't want 90 days to go by without having made some sort of touch on, with the client so that when the next matter comes in that they have that might use our expertise, they'll remember. I mean, it's sort of like who's on the top of the desk and who's in the Rolodex. So I think 90 days is about as long as one should go um, to sort of say, stay top of mind. What the thing I would say, two things, is first is understand that networking is a lifetime exercise and it's not a point and shoot and succeed exercise. So I go to lots of industry events because I'm in technology, a software entrepreneurs group or semiconductor group or whatever. I never expect to go to those meetings and come away with a client. But I just never know when I might or when they might meet somebody else or they might start a new company or where they might mention my name. You just don't know. So it's very hard uh, until you get yourself into that because it kind of feels like it's getting rejection letters. <laughs> you know? So, But just understand, it's a long-term, lifetime process. The second point is that the best uh, networking connections you make are the ones that become personal. And that goes to this point about measuring how it is. So if you, if you experience and you have a good personal connection with somebody, then that's a natural opening for you to try to have a different relationship. And understand that the more you can make it personal, the more successful it's likely to be. And the converse is true. If it doesn't become personal and somebody is just seemingly you know, doing you a courtesy, then that tells you also something about not pushing that one too hard. Al, you're the client. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, I, I've had the experience lately. I, I think our name in San Diego is a much tighter legal community, I think, than, than San Francisco, so this is part of it. But 
Um, last summer I had the experience of getting over a hundred emails in a week. And it was like somebody gave out the name of Sempra and said, contact everybody you know at Sempra because they're hiring. You know, I, I think one of the, the, the comments that was made is, you know, it is personal and you ought to define the, the nature and boundaries of the relationship that you're trying to create. Um, you know, you, if you have a good conversation, you know, it's not, you, you don't want to say, okay, well, that, that was not a no, so let me keep going back there. It's, look, I am interested in a job with your company or your firm. And um, I'm, you know, I'm actively looking elsewhere, but, you know, if, can, can we talk about that kind of thing now or in the future if you do have a position available? And most people will be pretty honest with you. It's, it's the people who just sort of out of the blue you know, are in, uh, calling you every week. And I had that experience as well. It, you know, it's, it's really uncomfortable uh, from our side as, as an employer. But, you know, we're always looking for bright people, in particular people who are persistent and who think they have something to offer. So, I, you, know, I, you know, find a point of entry and then establish the relationship that, that he was talking there's, about. I think that works. There's, in looking for business, when you're a lawyer, there are different visits you want to make to clients, and you could apply these. First, there's a, I want to learn about your business. And you can call someone and ask, Tally, I'm, I'm graduated from law school. I'm trying to pick a career that I have a passion for. I'd like to understand, what is it that you do every day? Can you tell me? You can use alumni for this. And, and just f find that out. And then focus your search on something that you have a passion for, that you want to do. And then there's the needs visit. Do you have any needs? And you can go, you can call those people who you made a connection with when the first visit, when you were looking for your passion, you say, I'm, I've now decided I want to pursue something. I, uh, what, what do people like you need? And what could I possibly do? And not just you, other people who do what you do. And then if you want the best way to stay in touch with them, listen carefully to what their needs are. And when you read something that you think might be of interest to them, forward it along. Or when you do something, you get an, uh, an assignment from someone or something, and you bring, and it's in an area that was of interest to them, you shoot them an email and you say, I just want to let you know, it, thanks to your help, I found this, and I've had this experience now, and I'd love to get more experience. So find ways to come back to them. But the best thing to do is ask some questions and listen, and then ask them what's comfortable for them in terms of getting back to them. Okay. And keep in mind, lawyers are really busy. Okay, and so when they, it doesn't mean just because they don't get back to you that they don't have a need. Stay on them. If, it, if, if, if enough time goes by and you don't hear, you can drop them off. But don't assume just because they don't get back to you right away that they don't have a need. They may, they're just incredibly busy. Okay, I think that's about the time we have, but uh, I think our panelists will feel that you didn't take what they said to heart unless they hear from you, unless you show up Saturday morning with a couple of cups of coffee and a bag full of donuts. Um, to establish that relationship. But I, I do want to take a moment uh, to thank all of them. I think it's been a wonderful panel and to thank all of you. <laughs>